So we're in our third week of our series, The Armor of God, which is a look at what the Bible has to say about spiritual warfare. At the end of his letter to the Ephesian church, Paul writes this, starting in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. So what is Paul doing here? What is he doing in this letter to the Ephesian church? He's giving a warning and an encouragement. And the warning that he's giving is that there are evil forces at work that you cannot see. So he says, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand. If you understand the Greek here, it means be able to resist. Paul says, look, man, there is an enemy. There's an enemy named Satan. And he is at work. And he wants to influence you. He wants to attack you. And if you allow him and his forces, they're going to knock you down in your faith. It reminds me of the words of Peter. He says, be sober-minded in 1 Peter 5.8. Be watchful for your adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking, looking, seeking for someone to devour. Now, as we said in our first week, Paul does not give this warning because he wants to cause Christians fear, to be afraid. Why? Because there is nothing to fear. As we read in Colossians, Jesus already defeated. He already got the victory. Colossians 2.15 says that he has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Paul's speaking about the death and resurrection of Jesus. So God is stronger than the enemy. That's why Paul says, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Remember, we talked about this. Satan is nothing more than a dog on a leash. Now, we should be aware of him, yes. Should take him seriously, yes. Does he have bite? Yes. But his chain can only reach so far. And unlike the man-made chains of today, he is held by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he ain't ever going to break that chain. I need an amen after that one. I don't ask for him often, but that was time for him. (laughs) So all we have to do to have victory as a believer in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, is you stay out of the reach of his chain, the reach of his bite. Now, how does a Christian do that? Well, the James, the brother of Jesus, tells us. In James 4, 7, he says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will do what, church? He'll flee. All right, great. What does it mean to resist the devil? This is where Tim's message last week came in when we talked about the belt of truth. In verse 14, Ephesians 6, he says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. The Roman soldier's uniform, the belt, it held everything together. And in the same way, truth is what holds everything together. And understanding what is true is important because it gives you the ability to discern what is real versus what is fake, what is actual versus what is fictitious, what is true versus what is false. And this is where the whole idea of resisting the devil comes in because this is what the devil is going to attack you with. Forget all the Hollywood movies that you've seen. The real threat is not, you know, demons crawling in your window, you know, and hiding in your, you know, cupboards to jump out and get you. It's not possessing some cabbage patch doll that you have that comes alive at night. No, the real threat of the enemy is getting you to believe lies versus believing the truth. Jesus said that the devil is a liar and always has been. He always will be. And I believe this is what a majority, 99% of spiritual warfare is. It comes down to resisting the lies of the enemy and standing in the truth of Jesus Christ. This is why Tim talked about the importance of taking every thought captive, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Stop believing every thought that just comes into your head, every feeling that you get. Stop and think, okay, wait a minute. What I'm thinking, what am I feeling, is this true? Hold it up, test it up against Scripture, 
and you chuck it if it does not align with the truth. That's how you stay alert. That's how you stay out of the reach of the enemy. That's how you stand firm in the armor of God. That's how you experience the victory of Christ that he has already won. Amen, church? Now, today, we are going to apply this idea of taking every thought captive as we talk about the second piece of the armor of God. Let's go back to the full version of verse 14. He says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate for the Roman soldier, he was a single piece of hammered metal, and it was worn in the front to protect all the vital organs from arrows and such. That's what the breastplate was. Now, what is righteousness? What is righteousness? Because this is not like a, a word that outside of the church you, you really used, hear used in modern-day vocabulary. Like, I was trying to think out of a negative term like self-righteousness. The last time I heard this word used was when I was watching, like, Finding Nemo. Anybody ever remember Finding Nemo, a little fish, right? Remember the uh, turtle they met, Crush? He's like a play on a total, you know, like California surfer dude, right? You remember at one point they run to, I don't remember why I remember this, but they, uh, they, they rode the underwater sea at current, and he's like, that was totally righteous, dude. Remember that? But what is righteousness? Righteousness means to be in right standing with someone. It means to be accepted. It means to be presentable. It means to pass inspection in the eyes of someone who is significant to you. It means to be found pleasing in the eyes of someone who you want to please. Now, even though this is not a word that we use much in today's culture, it represents a need that is critically important to every single person hearing the sound of my voice. It does not matter if you believe in God or not, wherever you're at in in faith, it, it don't matter. All of humanity longs. They long for righteousness. Every single one of us, we want to be accepted. We want to be presentable. We want to be in right standing. We, we want to pass the inspection. All of humanity has this in common. Now, another thing we all have in common is not a single one of us feels like that we're good enough to be accepted. Every single one of us, we feel a certain level of shame about who we are and what we're not doing or what we have done. And one of our constant fears is people seeing our flaws, us being exposed, and therefore being rejected. I mean, one of the great nightmares that we have, a dream that probably every single person in here has dreamed at one point or another, is that you're invited into some kind of setting, maybe it's school, maybe it's a party, it's work, and you show up either completely inappropriately dressed or you show up in your birthday suit. You show up naked. One study showed that 12% of dreams are focused on this. Why? Why would that be like the thing we dream about the most? Because at our core, I believe that we're worried about being exposed. We're worried about the vulnerabilities and shame in our lives. The feeling is so persuasive in us that we dream about it. Everyone dreams about it eventually. So what do we do? In our lives, we do everything we can to cover up our shame and our feelings of inadequacy, to hide our ugly so that we will be accepted, even in simple ways that we never think about it. Ladies, do you ever consider why you put on makeup? Now, I'm going to tread very carefully here. My wife warned me to. Uh, inner wisdom, and I'm not a professional. Gerda and Viola would be in that category. But think about it. I mean, makeup, it costs money. It takes work to put on. If you have children, it takes a miracle to put on, (laughs) right? It takes work to take off. And if you leave it on, it's bad for your skin. So why do we do it? And I'm not talking to like a special occasion. Like if you're, you go into some special event, you're wearing a certain color dress and you want to have your shoes and everything matching to accentuate it. I'm not, I'm not talking about those moments. But day to day, why do we go through the hassle of wearing makeup? Like where in our culture did we decide and why did we decide that makeup was necess- a necessity? 
Why can some ladies not even leave the house without it? I think because at the end of the day, it, it, it makes us feel better about ourselves. I shouldn't say ourselves. I don't wear your makeup. But actually, you know what? I actually, I do kind of. I'll be real. Never mind. Let me. Like, my beard is a lot grayer than this, right? Now, I don't color my beard, and I'm not saying anything about anybody that does. But, like, I do have a shampoo that Brother Lewis here showed me in all of his uh, hairstyling wisdom that, you know, kind of takes the gray and makes it a little bit more brown. Cost a couple more dollars than other shampoos. Why? Why do I do that? I mean, why? Really, at the end. My wife's always mar- already married to me. She's stuck with me. You know, it's, you know I mean, why do I, why do, I do it? I, if I admit it, there's probably some part of me that's like, I feel like I'm more accepted, more listened to if I have a little less gray. Where did I get that? Now, I'm not saying you should stop wearing makeup or dyeing your hair or any of this stuff. That's above my pay grade. What I'm trying to get to the point is inside of us, a lot of what we do, even little things, is to make up for this feeling of lack that we have inside of us. Like, I, I, there are men I know, they work like a dog because they feel like they'll be more accepted if they're seen as a hard worker to the extreme that they neglect their other responsibilities of discipling their family or loving their wives. And, I, and these same men, I know, I watch them walk around and they have sins in their lives. Their marriage might be falling apart if they're married or even if they're not married, they have the struggles that they're hiding and they want nobody to see them. They won't talk about them because they feel like it'll make them look weak or less than. Why did teenagers give in to peer pressure? Why did we give in to peer pressure when we were younger? Why do we have young women who give in to premarital sex when they really don't want to? Why do we have people who walk through this world as people pleasers? Because we're afraid of being rejected. We do not feel like we are enough. We need the approval of other people. We need it. It could be students. It could be friends. It could be coworkers, your people in church. A lot of times it's our parents growing up. I know people right now that they are in careers they do not enjoy, they do not love. In fact, they went into things, they forsake a career that they loved because they wanted to keep their parents happy. Apparently there's some, I hit a nerve in here. (laughs) I do provide free family counseling. (laughs) Now some of you, you're like, I don't care what people think. You're lying to yourself. I've said this. We all care what people think. We're trying to build walls to protect ourselves. And even if it was true that we did not care, at the end, we still care about the voice that's inside our own head. We care about the standards we set up for ourselves that we never live up to. Have you ever stopped to wonder why all of this is what it is? Like, why does every man, woman, and child walk the face of this planet, struggle with the need to be right in the eyes of those around them? Like, why do we even feel shame in the first place? Like, do we... Do we, where does that even come from? Why do we care? I have not found an answer to this question outside of the Bible. I'll tell you right where it comes from. In the Garden of Eden, you have Adam and Eve created by God. And it says this in Genesis 2.25, And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. They walked around in their birthday suits just as proud as they could be. They had a good kind of pride. They belonged to God. They were created by God. But then, after the serpent comes, got them to question God, to disobey God, we read this in Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What changed? They took their eyes off God. They decided I'll be my own master. Because that's what you do. When you disobey God, you essentially are saying, I can be my own God. Whether you admit it or not. And so as soon as they took their eyes off God, they became ashamed of themselves. And this is where it all started. And the Apostle Paul in Romans 1, he says that all of humanity has denied the origin of our shame. We've repressed it. We've ignored it. That no matter how much we ignore it, it doesn't remove the truth, the truth that the source of all of our shame 
comes from the fact that we know deep down in our souls we are not presentable to God. We're not. Hebrews 4.13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are, listen, is naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. But because we're ignoring God, pretending he is not there, we try to cover our shame by making ourselves uh, presentable to other people. Which in the end is a very insufficient way of making ourselves presentable to God. Now if you sit here today and you're not, I'm not a Christian, I don't know what I believe about God. Have you ever considered that the reason you battle shame, you battle this feeling of lack and insecurity, is because you're looking to the wrong things to cover your shame. And no matter what you jump through from one thing to another that culture tells you makes you important and lovable and likable, it's never enough. If you ever consider it's because you're missing God. There is nothing else, nothing, that is going to fill our need, our deep-seated need, for righteousness than to know that we are right with God. Now, as I said earlier, spiritual warfare, it is about battling for truth, okay? It's not battling for territory, as some would preach, where we're taking the fight to Satan. It's a battle over truth because Jesus already has the victory. So the question for you is, if you sit here today as a Christian, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord, are you going to walk in truth or are you going to fall victim to the lies of the enemy? If you sit here as a Christian, Scripture teaches that your feelings of shame, that your feelings of inadequacy, that your feelings of insecurity are all lies. Man, I wonder how our lives would change when we look in the mirror and we see the shame and we see ugliness and we see insecurity, if we stopped and said, man, this is a lie from the pit of hell. But we don't. We dwell on it. We think about it. We stew in it. The book of Romans says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None whatsoever. Now, to be clear, our feelings of shame, lack, or insecurity are not lies because we have no reason to feel shame or lack or lies uh, or or, uh, feel lack or insecurity. Okay, because of our sin, we have the right to feel all of those things. Our feelings of shame and lack of insecurity are lies because Jesus has made us righteous. Listen to the verses of Paul when reading Romans 3. He says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be be just and the justifier of the one who has faith. In Jesus. Let me sum this up for you. This is the beauty of the gospel right here. As Tim Keller once said, the gospel is not about you putting together righteousness and giving it to God. It's about God putting together righteousness and giving it to you. You see, I had shame. But Jesus gave me pride, the good kind. I was insecure. But Jesus gave me security. Yeah, who's there? Hey, how you doing? What do you got for me? All right, great, fantastic. You want to come to church while you're here? Oh, you got more. This has never happened before. Yeah, I got it. 
I got it. We're good. Thank you. Thanks, man. Have a great week. Okay. How you doing? Good. So it only took me 20 years of preaching to have someone deliver a package in the middle of service. All right. So I'll take it back. We'll come back together. Refocus. Without Jesus, I have no standing with God. With Jesus, I have right standing with God. I used to be an enemy of God, for that is what you are if you are not a Christian. But with Jesus, I'm a child of God. The gospel is God putting together righteousness and giving it to you as a gift. It's a passive righteousness, not an active righteousness that we receive through faith. But if we're being true and honest, if this was like easy for us to accept, I wouldn't need to preach on this. But it's hard for us to accept, even if you're a Christian. And I think this is where like putting on the righteousness of, of, of the best of righteousness, like it comes in. And, and that is giving ourselves constant reminders about his righteousness. This is why prayer is so important. This is why we emphasize reading scriptures together. This is why like singing songs, we don't do this just to hear each other's beautiful voices, right? Which some of you do. Some of you don't. I can say that because I'm one of the ones who don't. Right? We sing because we need to remind ourselves about who God is. Remember that old, I remember that old hymn came on this week. Remember this one? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. It is so important that we never miss an opportunity to remind ourselves of this truth. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to live a perfect, sinless life. You know that. If you're a Christian, you keep waiting for sanctification to kick in. You're like, when am I going to stop sinning so much? Right? So we need every opportunity to remind ourselves of this. Because this is one of the devices of the devil. He wants us to get to us to believe Listen to this. This is important. This is a device of the devil that he's using on you, and you need to be aware. He wants to get you to believe that your sin is so great, it's so powerful, that you have lost what God has given to you. He just whispers in your mind, in your head. You don't even recognize it's him. It's so subtle. But this is how you know the difference between the voice of the devil and the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to say, hey, what you're doing right now is sin. You need to run to your father. The devil's going to say, hey, what you're doing right now is sin. You need to run away from your father. He doesn't want to see you anymore. How many people I know as a pastor that when they get into sin, they do not want to come to church. They do not want to pray. They do not want to sing songs. Even me, when like I have sin, I'm less likely to want to pray, less likely want to read my Bible. And what I'm doing in those moments is I'm taking my eyes off of my Savior and I'm putting it on myself. These are the moments where we need to stand. These are the moments that we're not believing in the righteousness of God. If you feel... And this is another way to look at it. If you feel so bad that you don't want to go before God, if you beat your, yourself up and that God would never forgive your sins, so you can't go to him, he's done with you, you know what you're doing? You are failing to believe in Jesus. You're literally, without realizing it, calling Jesus a liar. You're still believing in yourself. Someone who puts on the righteousness of God, here's what they say. Satan gets in there, oh, you're a horrible sinner. And they're like, you know what? Satan, you're right. I am horrible. I am a sinner. I am the worst of the worst. I am dirty. I'm good for nothing. But Satan, the point is, my Savior's done something about it. He's completely covered it. He's taken care of it. He's paid my price, and now I'm a son of God. And God, I won't listen to you blasphemy the power of God's mercy. That's, when you're starting to get the gospel, that's when it, when it, when it, 
when it sinks in, when you can say, man, I am horrible. I'm so bad. I am a failure as a Christian. Praise Jesus. Too many of us, we sit here and we're like, oh, I'm horrible. I, God, no good for God. I just, I'm, I, I can't be near God. He, he'll never change me. I've done too much. I won't do enough. Or others, we get here and we're like, and we get too excited about ourselves. And I've done this and I've done that. And I look at these other dirty sinners over here. I sit in the, you know, I sit in the front rows. The dirty sinners sit in the back rows, right? You know, I, 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 I give more. I do it. But we got, this is the middle where we need to be where we say, yes, I am a dirty sinner. Praise God, Jesus has taken care of it. And I think the more, the lower view you have of yourself and the higher view you have in Christ is what causes people to raise their hands or to cry out to God or to sing because they realize what they've been saved from. The devil wants you to take your eyes off of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I... You come across people who are, who are battling sadness and, and, and you know, and, and, and some will come to them and they'll be like, you know what, you just need to know that God loves you just the way you are. He just loves you. Feel the love of Jesus, right? That's actually hogwash. It's really a subtle denial of the gospel. I mean, it's really nice to say, but it's hogwash. Because it's, what it says in those moments is, is what Christ did, did that didn't, didn't really matter. Because he just loves you the way you are. Two thumbs up. He smiles when he sees you. Right? But the gospel says, listen, if you're struggling with sadness, right, it's because you have something in your life serving as your righteousness that's not Jesus. You're looking to somebody or something else to make you right, to make you acceptable, to make you pleasing. If you're cast down, it's because your eyes are in somebody else and not Christ. And you know what you need to do? You need to repent. You need to say, Jesus, I got my eyes on someone else. I got my eyes on something else. I got my eyes on some role I play to make me right, and, and I repent of looking to that too hard. You are who makes me right with God. Help me to put my eyes on you. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Maybe the most powerful verse in all the Bible. It means that Christ, he died on the cross and he imputed a payment for you. He took his righteousness and he gave it for you. The things that you deserve, the consequences you deserved, they fell on Jesus. The gospel is that God now treats you us as sinners, he treats us as if we had done everything that Christ had done. There's an amazing passage in Romans 4. Not many people know this passage, but it's fantastic. Romans 4, 4, it says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, meaning Christ, his faith is counted as righteousness. Jesus did the work that we could never do. He pays the price that we could never pay. It is all about Jesus. This is how you resist the lies of the enemy. Actually, this is how you resist the lies of you tell yourself, because we don't need the devil to get caught up in lies. We can look in the mirror, and we can believe all the, our own lies about ourselves just fine. You go to 1 Corinthians sometimes, and Paul's talking about leadership and, and stuff like that, and he basically says, he goes, look, he said, if you judge me, to those that are reading, he goes, it's a small thing. He goes, I, you know what, I don't even judge myself. He says, my conscience is clear. But he goes, that doesn't make me innocent. It's God who judges me. In other words, it's God's voice who matters. Nobody else's. He goes, I don't even care what my conscience says. He goes, my conscience is sometimes good, and my conscience is sometimes bad. In other words, sometimes 
I tell myself what is true when I look in the mirror, and sometimes I tell myself what is not true. Man, I hate to break it to Disney, but that little insect Jiminy Cricket was a fool. He was dead wrong. Do not let your conscience be your guide. It's foolishness. Because my conscience sometimes tells me I'm clear when I am dirty. Sometimes it tells me I'm guilty when I'm innocent. He goes on to say, I don't even go based on what my conscience says. He goes, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what I think about me. I just care about what the Lord says. And it's the Lord who justifies me. Paul says, man, my eyes are on Jesus and Jesus alone. So that is one way that we put on the righteousness of God. Putting our eyes back on him, that he makes us right. And then the other way, there's one other way you put on the righteousness of God. Because remember, Ephesians is half about what God's done for us, and it's the other half is about how we should live. So in the back half, he says this. He says, put on the new self, Ephesians 4.24, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put on the new self. In other words, if you've received righteousness from God, you should strive to live a life of righteousness. This is the other way the devil gets you, right? If he can't get you on the one end that we spend most of the time talking about, he'll get you on this end. That you get you so wrapped up in the mercy of God that you no longer see the dangers of sin. You no longer see the dangers of the sin you keep committing over and over and over, slowly getting used to it. Or the dangers of your sin of omission, you not doing the things that God has called you to do in your family, in your life, and in your church, and you just get used to it as the devil is just massaging your shoulders and saying, it's okay, God loves you. All right, he's a God of mercy. Just one more time. The truth is a Christian who has received and understand the righteousness of God is going to pursue righteousness in their own lives. Some of you need to hear this today. 1 John 2.29, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Someone who understands that they've been made righteous by God will do what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his, anybody know the word? His righteousness. You see, a Christian is not going to tolerate or get used to sin in their lives. They're going to see this sin, and they say, you know what? My Jesus died for this, so I wouldn't be a slave to it anymore. Why would I run back to these shackles of sin? They're going to repent to God. They're going to find brothers and sisters in Christ and say, look, I've been struggling this. Will you help me walk in righteousness? I want to be all I can be for him. He died for me, and I want to, so I want to live for him. So church today, don't let the devil deceive you. If your faith is in Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, you have been made right with God. Okay, you've been made right with God. And, and you don't go through your life saying, man, I had a good week you know, because I got things right, or I had a bad week because I got things wrong, you're going to go and say, man, I'm going to have a good week because Jesus got everything right. And at the same time, you're going to put on the armor on God and say, man, God's called me to righteousness. I'm going to live it. I want to show the world the difference that he has made. So I'm going to repent of my sins. I am going to turn to him. I'm going to experience his grace and his mercy. And I'm going to play my part to walk in righteousness that others may get to see the righteousness that he gave me. Amen, church?